What is going on, everybody? It's Brad, and we're here for a Monday Night Raw review for October the 3rd, 2022. On Road to Extreme Rules, because this was the final night for Monday Night Raw. Of course, um, Wednesday, Friday will be the Go Home Show, which we'll have the review, and then we'll have ourselves a prediction on all the matches. Even though the the ending of the show tonight made it plain, painfully obvious what's going to happen with the Raw Women's Championship match, but we'll get to that later. We also had Bobby Lashley taking on Mustafa Ali, which... I see what WWE tried to do with this match, but in the long run, I don't think it's going to do what they want it to do. Unless they actually want to capitalize on it, and they kind of... I can't say they're actually going to be able to do that because of what they did afterwards. Also, Solo Sokoa takes on um, Angelo Dawkins. We have Dakota Kai versus Candice LeRae in her second match back. Johnny Gargano versus Otis, and Braun Strowman versus um, Chad Gable. And in the main events... We had Io, Shira, Io Sky versus uh, Alexa Bliss. Yay. So we started the show off with the Judgment Day. They had a match against Age of Styles and Rey Mysterio. But before that, they got to come out. Then they got to come out. Have a talky talk, 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 talk. They do get the mic to Dom, and we get a who's your daddy chant. He's like, I'll tell you who my daddy, who's not, who am my daddy. It ain't Ray. Says he hates him. He's hate. He's hate. He hates that. He hates him. He lied to him his entire life. Now he has a new family, and that is the Judgment Day. And I go on social, and I'm seeing this, and I see people like, "Who let Dominic have a microphone? Who let Dominic speak? Who let this? Who let that?" It's like I'm sorry. What? One, the promo was not that bad. It's not like this dude was going on a 20 minute monologue about how his father was um his father's his father's shadow no matter how big it is is um he, like no matter how small he is he has the, one a big shadow for him to hide behind and a bunch of other stuff of why he hates his father we didn't get any of that so i don't know why anyone is whining or complaining or bitching and moaning the fact that dominic mysterio went out there and cut a pretty much innocent promo so yeah Bella says they could have ended, he could have ended AJ Styles' career last week, but he chose not to because he's his friend. He says the olive branch is still extending and tells him not to make him do bad things. AJ Styles' music cuts him off. And AJ Styles and Rey Mysterio come out. Judgment Day is Finn Balor and Damian Priest versus Rey Mysterio and AJ Styles. The four men begin to brawl one, right before, one another before the bell rings. Dominic pulls Balor out of the ring before Rey hits a hurricane runner. We go to commercial break. So we have the match here. Match is good. As it's, it's, it's Rey Mysterio, it's AJ Styles, Damien Priest, Finn Balor. What the fuck did you think was going to happen? This was a good match. You know what was in also interesting about this show? No Kevin Owens at all. Which is fine. Um, back for break, Balor tags and Priest. The pair hit a backbreaker, leg drop combination before Priest goes for a pin. Styles kicks out and Priest locks in a leg, shoot, um, a leg crucifix. Styles colors with the in into a pin, but Priest kicks out. Now, Rey... Look at the tie, but Rhea pulls him off the apron. Priest delivers a clothesline before Rey tagging Balor. The two try to double team on Styles, but Styles hits a double DDT on them on the outside. Rey and Dominic face off. Dominic tells he just wants his father to hit. He wants Rey to hit him. Just hit him one time. It's just all those little mind games. It's eventually going to lead to. Rey Mysterio is saying he's never going to put his hands on his son. He's never going to hit his son. That's all fine and good. But we all know that eventually that's going to be one of those things that he's... Oh, like, a father or a, a human being has a limit on how far they can be pushed. And Dom is going to push his father and push Ray so... so Like, just going to keep pushing the buttons and taking the needle and pushing it in slowly and just pin, like needling this guy on the side over and over until eventually Ray Mysterio says, Fuck this shit, hits his son, fights him, and sends him running. Whatever they do for Survivor Series between Ray, Edge, AJ, and May and Beth, probably, but I don't know if they're gonna do that. But Ray, those guys versus the Judgment Day, how are they gonna like? Obviously, you make sure Ray and Dom do not actually touch. You don't like that's not where you're gonna have the first fighting interaction between Ray and Dominic Mysterio. It's just not gonna happen. By the way, again, Dominic should take the should drop the Mysterio name for now. Just saying. But he takes this and then he takes him down with the clothesline of the ring, Balor. Um, AJ is looking for the tag that distracts him enough for 
Balor, for Balor to hit the drop kick. Coup de grace. One, two, three. And the Judgment Day picks up the win. After the match, Rey Mysterio comes to the ring and he's trying to help AJ up. AJ struggles when he's like pissed off. Ray's like, I'm sorry, man. I was trying to help style, but but two getting yelling matches. Ray Mysterio says, It's my fault. I'm taking the blame. It's like, Yo, sure you did. It's your fucking fault. And then he eventually shoves him to the mat. Ray Mysterio leaves. Judgment Day attacks for AJ Styles from behind and kicks his right to the hand. So at least I, you have. Down, Damien, um, Finn Balor gets on top of him and starts mounting him, starts punching the hell out of him. He's like, I'm sorry, but I'm your only friend. You ain't got no one else. They are putting a big allusions to the judge. They are pretty much pushing the Good Brothers coming back to WWE. Everyone's expecting the Good Brothers to come back to WWE. Well, right now, Carl Anderson is still the IW, the uh, never open weight, um, heavyweight champion, a never open weight champion. So, unless he's going to be losing that at Autumn Attack or anytime soon for one of the Battle Autumn, like, they have Autumn Attack coming out, or uh, whatever the fuck was it? It's not Autumn Attack, I'm sorry. Uh, shit. What's the, they have, they have an event in a week from today. Seven days from now, they're going to have, they have um, some kind of, they have a show, I can't, Declaration of Power, that's right. Declaration of Power, where they don't have them, him defending the title. Ooh, it's got to be on Autumn Attack or sometime down the line. But with junior, with World Tag League and Junior Tag League going into November and December time, you know that New Japan Pro Wrestling wants the Good Brothers on that new that World Tag League. So I don't know how long they're gonna have this thing go, but I don't like unless the Good Brothers are coming back very soon. I don't see where this goes. It's either AJ Styles gets broken enough to where he says "fuck it, I'll join," or I don't know. We get a backstage video of Bobby Lashley. Kevin Patrick approaches him and asks him what's next for him. He says he will he will not be complacent. He says that his mentality will never change. He says he's beaten the best in the industry and has often has to often say he wants someone who has the same mentality as him. Mustafa Ali walks up and says he's done waiting for someone to call him. He says he's stepping up to the front of the line. Lashley says that he'll make sure he gets his opportunity before Ali says, No, 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 man. I'm not asking for an opportunity. I'm demanding it. Lashley says, Well, you want an opportunity? You got one. Now, I think a lot of people interpreted this that Bobby Lashley's like, oh, you want a U.S. title shot? Fine. No. I see what the hell they were trying to do with this. They, like, when the match happens, I'll talk about it. I know exactly what they tried to fucking do. And it didn't fucking work for a multitude of reasons. Back to break, we see Sami Zayn, Jimmy Uso, and Solo Sokoa. Solo Sokoa's just, you know, got his stone face looking on while Sami Zayn telling Jimmy about some fucking story. Um, you know, you could just see Solo Sokoa is like, don't laugh, don't laugh, don't laugh, don't laugh, don't laugh. He's got that don't laugh look. Sammy gets to the punchline, he's just, motherfucker, just laughing. Jay comes in, just pissed off, like, what's so funny? What's so funny? Yeah, but Jay, um, Sammy's like, yeah, that's, you know what, he's actually like, we're here about business, let's get the business going. They walk a bit, they walk a bit, they run into the street problems. Montez Ford has a boot on his leg, so he can't wrestle. Angela Dawkins has it, runs his mouth a little bit, and then Solo Sokoa backs everyone up and says, I'd like to see you try with me. And he's like, fam, okay, sure, I'll see you out there. So, Angela Dawkins and Solo Sokoa later on. Wrestling versus Mustafa Ali. Wow, WWE really loves to copy all elite wrestling, don't they? Because this was carbon copy, for the most part. Bobby Lashley, Mustafa Ali was Cody Rhodes versus Darby Allin, without, without the tie. That's 1,000 fucking percent what they tried to do here. They tried to build Mustafa Ali. The big, the big difference between what they did in All Elite Wrestling at that show, Fighter Fest, where Darby Allen just would not stay down, Cody couldn't beat him, and they just, they, they just went to a 20-minute long, 20-minute um, draw, was because no, next to nobody knew who the fuck Darby Allen was. Darby Allen was a young, up-and-coming guy who's not had any mainstream exposure up until that match with Cody Rhodes. They tried to copy that in this match, where Bobby Lashley should have won this match quite quick. But Mustafa Ali, who has been in WWE for, notes, six years, has had start, stop and start pushes. And now WWE... Wants us to try and get this guy, like, go out there and have a match with Bobby Lashley, the United States champion, 
and go out there and say, this guy has all the heart in the world. Bobby Lashley's trying every single way to beat this guy down and just beat him, and he just couldn't get it done. And Mustafa Ali fights and fights and fights with all the heart and soul that he has. And then in the end, Bobby Lashley does win, but it's not by tap out. Bobby um, Ali fades. So, basically, and after the match, Ali, he goes to help Ali up. Seth Rollins blindsides him, hits him with a curb stomp, puts the second one on the United States Championship. Then spots Ali on the outside, hits him with a curb stomp, and that was that. What was the fucking point? I know, I know, I know. They wanted to do Seth Rollins. They're, they're, they're continuing Seth Rollins and Bobby Lashley. They're going to have a title match next week. The night, two nights after the fight pit. It would have been fine if you would have had him help up Mustafa Ali. He hold, like raises Mustafa Ali's hand. Mustafa Ali leaves. Bobby Lashley goes and does his pose. He comes out and Seth Rollins attacks him after Mustafa Ali disappears. Having him, having Mustafa Ali do this entire like, I'm I'm full of heart and I'm full of heart and I can't get. He's not. I'm gonna do everything I can to make sure Bobby Lashley does not beat me. Only for him to pass him out. And then Seth Rollins just stomp on him on the outside. It did literally fucking nothing. This was absolutely WWE going, Hey, um, Cody, uh, remember that match you had with Darby Allin back in 2019 at the first Fighter Fest? I think, yeah, it, it was Fighter Fest. Fight for the Fallen was Cody, was the Rhodes versus the Bucks. So, yeah, that Fighter Fest match, you know the one where Cody Rhodes, after the, after the tiebreaker, had his head caved in by Sean Spears? Yeah, that match. That's what they tried to do here, and it did not fucking work. Everyone knows that Mustafa Ali was the heart and soul of 205 Live. 205 Live has been dead for two years, if I'm correct. Or a year and a half, or whatever it was. Maybe, yeah, it's been a year. I think it's been about a year. 205 Live has been dead. Why, oh fucking why, should I give two shits when you do this? What happened to Mustafa Ali versus Cedric Alexander? That would have been a damn good tag team for this tag team division that still needs resurrected. They get one tryout match together. I thought they looked pretty decent. Could have um, a little rough around the edges, but eventually could have worked into something. All of a sudden, nope, that was thrown out the window, and now Mustafa Ali is supposed to be this guy with all this heart who stood up to Bobby Lashley, survived Bobby Lashley for the most part. It, it didn't work. It did not have that same heart overall, and Cody Rowe, Going over Darby Allen it, without Darby beating him, but also Darby like him like him not being able to beat Darby at that time helped Darby more than this was going to help Ali because again Darby Allen in 2019 was an unknown commodity to 95 percent of the audience, maybe about five percent of a audience in 2019 19, knew who Darby Allen was. I sure as hell didn't know. I didn't know anything about Darby Allen. That match helped make Darby a fan favorite. This, I don't know what the fuck they wanted, they thought they were going to accomplish with this, but it failed. Big time. So we got a break, we come back, Seth Rollins in the ring with the mic, he says he had cleared Bobby Trashley from the ring. Gee, I heard of certain podcasters calling Bobby Trashley about a couple years ago, I wonder if Seth was listening to him. No, it wasn't me. Look at the Monday Night Rollins, he, before he addresses Matt Riddle and says that that fight pit will be synonymous with his name. We see a video that shows the fight pit, which we've had the Timothy Thatcher and Matt Riddle highlights. We had Tommaso Ciampa and, Matt, and, Tom, and Timothy Thatcher highlights. Somebody had those. I think Timothy Thatcher had his face, his mouth broken in the match against Ciampa. Rollins says that he will show Riddle what, it show, what he's shown lastly in Cody Rose. He's the most dangerous man in the history of the industry. He calls Riddle the ring because they have a face-to-face -face schedule. But, and I fucking called this about three weeks ago, no contact allowed. They have, they, this is, this is one of those, this, this is great when they do this. AEW's done this before when they did John Moxley, Eddie Kingston. They had done this in WWE multiple times. When you have a blood feud, you go into the go-home show, face-to-face, -face, no contact from either. You have each side go out there spitting bars, trying to get out the other person's skin. Trying to get them to hit them. And, of course, that never happens. But it's always great to see that, oh, they're going to hit him. Oh, they just want to hit him. Come on, you know you want to hit him. He dug deep there. He tells him, paying respect to the king of fight of the fight pit, reminds him, reminds him he's never even been in, a match in the match before. 
before we almost re reiterate the no contact clause, Riddle tells him not to worry about that and says he's there to give him a lesson in the fight pit. He says he's going to kill him and says the fans will be singing, bro. And Seth Rollins says Daniel Cormier will have his back because he's, um, and he's like, you have a nice singing voice. Do you sing your kids to sleep like that? Oh, that's right. You can't even see them. He does in the hit of a fourth thing. He needs all the cash he can get because child support is kind of expensive nowadays. Riddle says that Rollins' breath is gross. Then asked if the last time he held a title was. He asked if it was the last time he made an event at WrestleMania. Oh, that's right. You never did. But Becky sure had it. I know everyone wants to sit there and say, oh, him cashing in the main event of WrestleMania means he technically main event of WrestleMania. Bullshit. What he means is actually start to finish match. Come on, people. He says, and, and this was obviously um, pulled directly from that Ariel Hawane and part two interview that Seth Rollins had with Ariel Hawane, where, where he said he always, like, in his career, he's always felt like second place compared to a Danielson or a um, CM Punk or Nigel McGuinness or Roman Reigns or Dean Ambrose, aka John Moxley. It's it's kind of sad though because I remember back when John Moxley was an aide when WWE is Dean Ambrose. The hierarchy was Roman was one of the of the three Shield members. Who was the best of the three? Roman was number one. Seth Rollins was number two, and Dean Ambrose was a third, a, a very far behind three in WWE's pecking order. Except for that WWE Championship run that he had in 2016, Dean Ambrose, which. They, tried, they gave him a backing, but they didn't really put too much effort into him. But when it came to like how they viewed, it felt like they viewed the, the, these guys, it was Roman 1, Seth 2, Dean Ambrose 3. Then Dean Ambrose leaves, goes, and reinvents himself as John Moxley again. And when you look at the Shield members, Roman and John Moxley are the number one guy in both of their companies. They are number one in both of their companies, and, Sean, and Seth Rollins is like the third wheel. Man, how time has changed. And they are just yelling and screaming at each other. Daniel Cormier, Cormier pops up on the Titan Tron. This kind of was a little lame here. I mean, they couldn't have they couldn't fly Daniel Cormier out to Minnesota, um, St. Paul to come out and get between these two and say something. No, they had him pop up on the um screen and that kind of took the heat away. You should have had Daniel Cormier in there, come in there, put himself between these two. And all that. He said he's tired of the behavior. Everyone's tired of the behavior. He introduces himself and dresses both men. He says the fight pit match needs a third man. and says he plans to put the end of their issues. He says he'll see them both in Philadelphia. Rollins and Knox Riddle hat off his head to the back. Then we head backstage to see Candice LeRae. She runs into Bianca Belair, Alexa Bliss, and Asuka, who wished her luck with her upcoming match with Dakota Kai. Who joins Damage Control for War Games? I can't wait till Saturday's done it over with so we can just get the War Games build. That's next week. Back from break, we have backstage the Miz. He says that the issue with his low life will end tonight. He says he isn't leaving until he is assured something is done. He says nothing will ruin his birthday celebration next week. We see Dexter Lucian and Loomis spying on him. Okay. Candice LeRae heads down, followed by damage control. Candice LeRae versus Dakota Kai. The match was decent. Of course, what you expect to happen, damage control gets, in char gets involved. Distraction, Bailey helps Dakota Kai. Dakota Kai picks up the win. Damage control want don't want a match. Wow! I mean, it sucks that it had become the expense of Candice LeRae in only her second match, but obviously, it's the numbers game. Damage control had the numbers against Candice LeRae. Later on, damage control has the number of the game against um, Alexa Bliss. It's just all about the numbers game, and Can and Candice is going to join Team Belair, and uh, Shotzi might join Team. Belair as well. I'm not sure. It feels like that's what they may go with. I take Shotzi over the code over Raquel Rodriguez. Just saying. The other side, who joins Team Dable? Do not know. We then see Johnny Gargano backstage. Dexter Lumis appears. He is just there with the knocked out Miz, heading him. Johnny Gargano then stops as he's walking forward past them, and he walk goes back. He and Dexter Lumis is gone. He goes over to the Miz, who's knocked out, and pokes him. Miz is like, ha, ha, ha. and he has a picture, a caricature of himself, Loomis, and a cake. He's up, and Johnny's like, oh, that's not good. 
Mitch runs and Johnny's just like, oh, Dexter. That's, uh, he's like, oh, Dexter. Like, he has that inflection in his voice, like, oh, that's silly, Dexter. So, next week, expect Dexter Loomis to put Miz to a cake. Can we get something? What, like, what should happen and what I'd love to see happen is the cake is under a silver platter thing. It's like a small cake. They open it up and it has words on the cake for what his, why he's targeting him. I don't know. It's really annoying. Johnny Gargano versus Otis. Hey, look, another distraction by the referee distraction. There he gets, hits Gargano from behind with his briefcase. Otis gets his finisher and gets the win. Thing, I guess Vince, Vince, Triple H really loves his distraction finishes because you see it in this match. You saw it in the previous match. You saw it in the match in the main event. He even saw it in Sol Sokola and um, Angelo Dawkins' match. I am so tired of seeing ref um, referee distractions. Hunter, come up with something new. You didn't have this, like, you didn't have this many referee distractions in NXT. Unless I missed something. After the match, the trio beat down Gargano. <laughs> comes in. Heads down. Levels Otis. And while Fury manages to escape, he drags Gable into the ring. Tosses him into the ring. Then the bell rings. Tosses him in the Otis on the outside. This match lasted. I think it ejected after we came back from break. Gable fires several right hands on Strowman. You see almost watching on his Gable fires right on his right hands. Strowman hits Gable on the top rope before Gable escapes and delivers a kick to the knee. Hits him as a drop kick. Strowman managed to pull out a power bomb for the pin and the win. Clearly, the, um, the running for them is they're going to have Omos versus Braun Strowman. I would not. I really don't care about that at all. Honestly, if you don't have Braun Strowman in the um, war games against the Bloodline, you're really, you're really. That's a missed opportunity for the Braun Strowman character. That's that, that he would thrive in that as the final guy for the babyface team to come in and just wreck everybody and just destroy everything. And then him and Roman could go one on one. And at the Royal Rumble. Time for a break. Bobby Lashley is being checked on by medical personnel. Kevin Patrick approaches him and asks how he's doing. Lashley says he's going to crush Seth Rollins next week. Puts his United States title on the line so there's no excuses. Seth Rollins is going to be your new, it's probably going to be your new United States champion next week. Grace stands in the ring, introduces Bale and Bianca Belair. The pair make their way to the ring. It's time for the contract signing. Graves then offers up the contract for the match. Bailey Mockering asks how she feels and says her plan has been going according to plan. She says that they left the, her girls in the back in a favor as a favor before signing her name. She says that the ego got her into this match. She says a lot of the symbolics on the of her entire WWE career, saying she had to climb and climb her way to the top in her process, and she was like her with a ponytail. She says the signs used to say Bailey, and little girls used to dress up as her. They used to have the, they used to wear headbands, their ponytails off to the side. And they changed over time the cheers faded and she says fans stopped caring and her career spiraled. She says she had climbed her way back to the top. But cuts her off and says, signs her name on the contract. But that says Bailey continues to run her mouth. She says the chip on her shoulder has nothing to do with her and she will never be like her. But that says that everything she did didn't work because she was pretending to be someone she wasn't. Oh, really, Bianca? Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't your EST gimmick that you've been doing since you were in NXT? Wasn't that a heel gimmick? Isn't you coming out and say you're the best, the fastest, the quickest, the smartest, the toughest, the roughest? Isn't that a cocky heel gimmick? I'm saying, who's who's pretending to be someone they're not? I think that's you. And that's that's very rich for Bianca Belair to come out here and say Bailey was being somebody she wasn't, like pretending to be someone she's not. When that's Bianca Belair, since she turned babyface, that is Bianca Belair. This whole EST gimmick is a heel gimmick. It works so much better when she was a heel in NXT. You want to know why it fucking faded away? Because they had to go up against Shayna Baszler, she had to play a babyface, and she sucked ever since. Bianca Belair needs to turn heel ASAP. She fucking is, I'm just, she's insufferable as a babyface. She says she is her authentic self all the time. Bullshit. Says she still stays ready until she doesn't have to get ready. Says that since her, she likes planning, she used to plan to still call her champion after Extreme Rules. Bailey asked her girls how they cut, 
R, and we cut the EX Shikai and Dakota Kai attacking Alexa Bliss and Oscar backstage. Bailey leaps across the table and throws Bianca across by Lara Classic. But then went Bailey into the apron and runs to check on Bliss and Oscar. She asks if they're okay. We see Oscar crying, holding her leg. Not, I'm sorry, I would never have Oscar look like she's crying. I would not do that. Who booked that shit? You just see, um, you see Alexa Bliss just, just like getting this, like getting this, like pissed off. She's just like, ah, 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 ah. this is over. Yo, you, me, tonight. She said it a lot better than I did there, but you know what I mean. Back from break, commentary runs down the extreme card. He still looks cool, and it says the same thing. All head to the ring. Street Profits after them, and we have Solo Sokoa versus Angel and Dawkins. The story of this match is the fear the further dissension between um, Sami Zayn and Jay Uso. There was a fourth match towards the end of it where, Sam, where Solo Sokoa had down for like 12 seconds, but the referee was distracted because Sami Zayn and Jay Uso were up on the apron yelling at each other, screaming and yelling. So. Dawkins, of course, takes advantage of this. So, Solo kicks out and Dawkins knocks him to the outside. Zane and Jay begin to argue on the outside, which this this was a very smart way to set up for the, like, toe pay to the outside. Everyone has to stand around and catch it. Sammy and Jay are arguing with each other around where Solo is. Jimmy comes in and tries to split these guys up, and they got themselves positioned while arguing to where Dawkins could come in and hit the toe pay onto both of the Usos. Um, Sami Zayn did not get hit because Solo gets back in the ring. Sami just like starts yelling at Angelo Dawkins, allowing he gets smacked and gets his, he gets bitch slapped down, allowing Samoa um Sokoa to hit the super kick. Samoa drops, spinning Solo one, two, three, and Th- Solo Sokoa. Thanks again, partially to Sami Zayn, picks up the win. We had and. After the match, um, Sami Zayn and Jey U- Jimmy Uso come into the ring. Jey Uso, I don't think they had it on camera, but they had it focused that was Solo, Jimmy, and Sami helping him celebrate the match. Backstage, Otis and Austin Theory, we had, he asked where Chad was. And he, um, he, Otis says, hold on a second, goes and grabs Chad. And he says he'll face John Gano next week once and for all, and he'll put him down a town down. We had a video of Edge. He says that he's been transparent since coming back. By the time he had to make the choice whether or not to come back, he was 46 years old. He says that his, his, it, that his decision is not just hurting him, but his entire family. He discusses why, the ways in which he's affecting his wife and his daughters. He addresses Judgment Day and says he knows what he has to do. And one, be a one-man gang, he tells Finn Balor that he's facing someone he's never seen before on Judgment Day. Can't physically hurt him enough to say, I quit. Oh, really? No. That kind of gives away what's going to happen at the pay-per-view, which is absolutely fine. We'll talk about that on Friday. Lexa Bliss is at EO Sky. If I told you I gave a shit about this match, I really didn't. The only thing that you have to see is distraction, 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 distraction. EO wins with the uh, moon over the, um, what the fuck did they call it? They call it, oh, shit, shit, shit. They call it the moon over something. Like, it was like the, it's not the Asai Moonsault, which is the actual name of the move, but they actually gave it a fucking name for Fuck all, because they gotta they gotta copyright everything, man. They gotta get they gotta get those um those t shirts and everything. I wrote it down here. Wrong social, wrong social one. I want to go to mines, 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 mines. But like, this is the thing. The match ended with five minutes left on the clock. I'm like, why? Why is this match ending already? Why don't they go another three minutes? Well. You figure something's got to happen, right? Maybe we'll get a return. Maybe a debut. No, we get a beatdown. They call it... Uh, what they call it? They call it... They call it... They call it uh, oh, I must not have wrote it down. It was a weird-ass fucking name. But they beat down Alexa Bliss. EO, EO and Sky, Kai, Sky and Kai go out and get the um, get a ladder. Bianca Bell comes in, fights off Bailey for a minute until they hit her with the ladder. Like, not take her down with the ladder. Oscar, who is in the back, comes limping down with a kendo stick. It's a couple shots in before she gets taken out. All three of the baby faces get laid out. Rose plans, everyone else gets knocked out. The show ends, goes off the air, with Kai and Sky and Bailey all standing on the ladder, holding the championship gold. Bailey has the Raw Women's title, and the other two had the tag team titles, and that's how the show went off the air. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. No. 
they had enough time left that Jimmy Schmidt and the rest of the commentary went over the fucking card again. Five extra minutes. I know we, I know I complain about AEW having time problems, but my god, five extra minutes for this goddamn beatdown would like, make the title match on Saturday painfully obvious who's winning. It sucks, but it's painfully obvious. And we might see a return. Who knows? We might see many returns on Friday. On Saturday. All I know is... Not really a great episode of Raw. I mean... You had the Rams 49ers, and the 49ers blew out the Rams, so it's not like you were really working with much on Monday Night Football this week, but... This was not a great show at all. This was mid. This was mid. There was good stuff on there. The tag team match opened the show. But I'm so tired of distraction finish after distraction finish after distraction finish. My goodness. How about me bumping one of them for fuck's sake? Something different. Like, my goodness. But that is, like, I just can't wait till Saturday's over so we can come back here. We can shit on the fucking DX reunion that's going to fucking take up 20 minutes of time on TV. And we can start building towards war games. Because that's the only thing I fucking care about coming up. I don't even give a shit about this pay-per-view coming up. The ma- the shows look, the, the pay-per-view matches look fine and everything. But I just want to get to war games and see what Triple H has for more games. But that is your Monday Night Raw review. Hit that subscribe button. Comment down below. Like or dislike this video. Find me on Minds of the France Club. Find me on Twitch.tv slash the France Club. And find me on Instagram at the France Club. And I'll see you guys. On Wednesday for AEW. Until then, my name's Front, and I'll see you guys later.